Um, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, I'm really excited to have this conversation with you all today. My name is Patty DeBow and I'm the president at Parsons TKO. Um, PTKO is a consulting firm that works with nonprofits and other mission driven organizations on the strategy, data, and technology surrounding their outreach. Um, so we work with communications, marketing, fundraising, and IT teams um, on all of their outreach work. Um, we've got a great group of panelists with us today, Kate, Sue Ann, and Jim, um, who I look forward to introducing you to. And you may also see my colleagues, Mickey and Lisa from PTKO um, popping in and out of the chat. So if you have any questions or issues, um, please feel free to pop them there in the chat and Mickey or Lisa will help you out. Um, but otherwise we will just get rolling. Um, I'm really excited to have the conversation on this topic today of diversifying our audiences. Um, and I wanted to share a little bit of context about why we put this together um, and what we've been thinking and talking about. Um, I think it's important to recognize that we are having this chat in the moment of our kind of current cultural context as well. And over the last couple of years since George Floyd's murder in 2020, um, Organizations from large to small have really been re-examining the way they operate and the way they communicate. Um, and that's rightfully so. It's probably long overdue in many cases. And I think we as the sort of communicators, fundraisers, um, other outreach professionals in this sector have also been grappling with how we manage this and how we talk about it. Um, and for whatever reason, over the last several months, I have been in a number of conversations where someone has said to me, we really want to diversify our donor base, or we really want to reach a more diverse audience with our comms and marketing. Um, and you know, to be very frank, sometimes that question doesn't always sit right with me, um, as if diversity itself is the goal. Um, and so I've had some really wonderful conversations with colleagues trying to unpack that and understand how we can get to you know, a deeper understanding of what our role is as folks who are doing communications and outreach with our audiences um, and what kind of goals should we be setting and what kind of examination of our practices do we need to do. And I think, you know, the punchline is it boils down a little bit just to good communications practices in general. Um, but it's been a really interesting series of conversations I've had one-on-one -on -one with folks and I'm really excited to bring together the group today to hear more about um, what our esteemed panelists have to say. Um, before we kick off um, with the intros and questions, I did want to just kind of pull the group really quickly and understand, you know, how are these conversations happening in your organization? Um, you should see a sort of, uh, you know, poll pop up on your screen momentarily in Zoom, but I also welcome you to kind of pop your answers into the chat. Um, you know, has someone asked on your team recently, how do we diversify our audience? Um, if so, kind of how was that received? What is your team doing about it? Um, you know, I'm really curious to hear uh, from the group today, like where you are in the journey of having this conversation with your team. Um, so please feel free to chime in and uh, let us know what your team is thinking and talking about. All right, to get us started, um, I wanted to, I will kind of pose a question and then ask each of our panelists to sort of introduce themselves in their organization and then um, to also just kind of dive into that question. And so the first question is, I wanted to understand as a baseline for the, the folks that are on our panel today, talking about who your organization's kind of core audience has been historically, um, and what does it mean to you as you're thinking about expanding that? What kinds of new audiences are you seeking to reach? Um, so I'm gonna go across my screen um, and maybe just start with Kate Villarreal. Sure. Thank you so much, Patty, and thank you to everybody for tuning in today. It's great to be here. So I'm Kate Villarreal, Senior Director of Strategic Communications for the Urban Institute in Washington, D.C. Um, so Urban is a nonprofit research organization focused on social and economic policy. Uh, my role there, I'm lucky to lead a team of fabulous communication strategists and media relations staff who are really focused on this question of how to best package up our research and deliver it to our target audiences and ideally in ways that inspire impact and action. And so to get to your question, Patty, I think historically our audience, we've been around for a while. We were founded in 1968 by LBJ. Um, so given that foundation, our audience has traditionally been very Washington DC centric, very much within the bubble of, of primarily federal policymaking. Um, 
But in more recent years, we've really evolved that concept and really expanded it to think about our audience as what our president calls change makers. And she defines change makers as anybody who's in a position to take the data and research that Urban is generating and apply it and, and really um, you know, apply it to making better decisions, to creating some kind of broader uh, community impact with that data. And so that federal policy audience is still super important, but we've broadened it out to include, for example, uh, community organizers working on housing affordability issues or a philanthropist who wants to make an investment in, in reducing poverty and wants to get you know, evidence on what the best strategies are to do that or a rural community leader who's looking uh, for advice on how to mitigate the effects of climate change in their community. So I think we're, where we've really put energy, like we're definitely thinking about diversity in terms of racial diversity. We want to be reaching communities of color in addition to, to white communities. But I think where we've had the most success is just broadening that universe of who are the people that could really benefit from the work that we're doing, that could benefit from knowing about us. And I think that's where we've seen some good impact. That's great. Thanks for sharing that, Kate. Um, I will pass it off to Sue Ann. Hey everyone, I'm Sue Ann Tannis. I'm Senior Director of Integrated Communications at the United Nations Foundation. Um, basically, the UN Foundation exists um, to really support the mission and work of the UN um, to make our world a better place, a place that is more equal, more just, more sustainable. Um, at UN Foundation, I really lead on what I call the three C's content, channels, and creative, and basically the measurement of how those things perform. Um, and I'm supported by a wonderful team um, who really is passionate about what we're talking about today. Um, I think, Patty, your question was, you know, who have we historically viewed as our organization's core audiences? Um, essentially, um, that used to be primarily US-based um, people who were globally engaged or globally interested um, in making our world a better place, whether that's moving the needle on climate change, gender equality, um, global health. I think what has happened over the past two years specifically, um, especially in the context of a global pandemic, is that that audience for us has become more global. And I'll talk about this later, but we saw it coming through in our data first and foremost, that we were having um, a bit of a shift in our data um, in terms of who was visiting our digital properties. Um, it was you know, skewing to the point where it used to be majority US and it dipped as low as 35% US um, and 65% outside of the US. And so basically seeing that shift that demanded us to really look at who are we really trying to target? Um, who is our message resonating with the most? And then how could this all go well for not just our work and our communication strategy, but also the work at the UN? Um, and that's basically the evolution path that we've been on and um, have been gathering some interesting insights and connecting um, more broadly globally um, around some of the issues that we know are core to the UN's work. Great. Thank you, Sue Ann. Um, and I want to pass it to Jim Hugh for your intro, Jim. Great. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Hu. I'm the um, Executive Vice President of Audience at Participant. Um, I've been at Participant for around three and a half years, um, started off uh, running strategy and more recently moved over to much more of an operational role uh, in this newly formed audience team, which largely um, oversees our digital activation across social media, uh, web, and, uh, and also email. Um, and you know, for us, it's really, uh, at, you know, participant, I'll give you a little bit of background of what we do. Participant, first, first and foremost, we are um, a film company, and um, we've made, um, we've produced films that you guys may have heard of, um, An Inconvenient Truth, um, Spotlight, American Factory, uh, Roma, um, Judas and the Black Messiah, um, and these are all um, also, you know, films that have, have won a lot of awards, which is really great to see. Um, the company was, was was founded in 2004 by uh, Jeff Skoll, um, who you may have heard of the Skoll Foundation, um, but Jeff was also, you know, um, he made his his, his billions um, as a, as a co-founder of eBay um, and, and after um, really went and, and created a foundation to, to really start to tackle some of the, uh, the most um, significant issues of our of that are affecting humanity. Um, and then also really looking at um, film and storytelling as a key way um, for for people to really um, you know, be able to be inspired by stories and to think differently and to, and to think about ways to really be able to, to take greater action. Um, so um, a lot of what we do right now um, is 
so much of our diversity pathway, um, and really I think it's not just diversity, but it's also diversity and um, belonging and inclusion. Um, so much of our evolution starts internally. It starts with us, um, it starts with us as a company, it starts with us um, in terms of our culture, it starts with our values. Um, and I think so much of this is really, as I mentioned, it is a journey. It is not a, um, it is never a, um, a moment where we say, okay, we're done or we've succeeded or, uh, you know, mission accomplished. Um, but it is a continuous evolution um, in terms of how we look at ourselves, um, uh, you know, and how we relate to each other um, and also how we relate to our partners um, and how we relate to our audiences as well. Um, so if you're thinking about all the different films that I just, um, that I just listed and, and, and other films that are in our pipeline, our audience has traditionally been um, um, very, uh, very affluent, um, um, very much left-leaning and, and democratic-leaning, um, and also predominantly um, you know, more uh, Caucasian than the, uh, than the U.S. population. Um, but we start to see a shift, and I think um, a lot of that shift really does start uh, with who we work with um, and the artists that we work with and the stories that we bring to life with the different art, uh, sets of artists that we work with. So um, as, as, uh, as our evolution continues and as our slate of films, uh, both in the documentary and, and narrative side begins to evolve, um, we also see our audiences evolving too. And so I think it's really just important to recognize that um, diversifying really starts again internally, starts with you, starts with um, your organization, starts with your values. Uh, and that's, the, that's probably the most authentic way to really begin to diversify um, the people that you talk to um, and how you talk to them uh, and who you start to develop partnerships with. Um, and um, so for us, this is again, very much a long-term journey and the only way that we can really um, um, point to um, our progression um, is really around the art that we bring to the world um, and the artists that we um, that we were able to, to give a platform to. So, um, but from there, um, our job is, uh, after the movie comes out, our job is to build impact campaigns um, around um, certain titles. And um, this is where a lot of my role comes in, which is a lot of fun, is how do we start to solve this problem of Yes, we've been able to reach um, a larger, um, more diverse audience. How do we now get them more engaged in the change that we're trying to create and, and get them more engaged with the partners that we're trying to support uh, on the ground, uh, a lot of the impact partners that we work with? And how do we get them to come back and continue to be um, participants with us and with our partners so that the next set of films um, it, down the road um, continue to and really be, we're able to really build that level of audience infrastructure so that people will come back and continue to support not only our films, um, but most importantly, um, our impact partners too. Great, thank you, Jim and everyone. There is already so much to dive into in what you all have shared. Um, I wanted to start by honing in on something that Sue Ann shared about um, exploring the data around your audiences. And you know, as I've thought about this topic, um, one of the things I keep coming back to is there are a lot of kind of core good practice comms and outreach um, practices that really are kind of very impactful in helping to quote unquote diversify your audience or reach new audiences um, about just being intentional with who you um, are trying to reach, making sure your content's relevant and having the good infrastructure um, in place uh, to support that. Um, we've got actually some thoughts in a blog post on this that maybe one of my colleagues will share in the chat, but. Um, I wanted to talk about this idea of data because Sue Ann, I think you honed in on something interesting, which is there was actually insight in your data where your audience was not what you expected. Um, and so maybe you could just share a little bit more about that experience. Like what kind of um, data practices do you have in place to sort of monitor and understand who your audience is? And once you all realized that, um, you know, what are you doing with that data and information going forward? Yeah, happy to share more on that. Um, if Tony's on the call, he would know that we have spoken ad nauseum about, you know, just what it means to build a data culture um, within a marketing and communications team in particular. Um, and so we have been obsessive 
about measuring and monitoring and tracking our audiences across every single platform, not just understanding um, the vanity metrics, you know, like, you know, what is our engagement rate? What are our impressions like? What's our reach? But also drilling deeper to really begin to establish and identify personas um, for the folks who are visiting um, our property. So that's been pretty much a mainstay of the work that we do. Um, and we do that, you know, from daily to weekly to quarterly to monthly um, to annually and sort of use that to really shape our strategy. Um, you know, when it comes to audience, it's really interesting because like you said, the data started to reveal that shift to us. And, you know, the big question is, well, what do you do when you see that shift happening, when you know that you've been sort of designing and, and, and planning your communication strategy around this, another type of audience? For us, that shift was really the start of more intentional, earnest um, activities to diversify our content and who was represented in our content. So I'm really huge on passing the mic, right? Um, who do we pass the mic to to ensure that we're elevating voices, that the audience that is showing up to our content can see themselves represented um, in those people. So whether it is indigenous people who are on the front lines of climate change, whether it is um, a girl or a woman in Bangladesh um, who is advocating for gender equality, against all odds. It's sort of like we took the opportunity to really raise those voices. And then for us, another strategy that worked well for a campaign that we launched around gender equality called Equal Everywhere was to really go big on the UGC. Um, so user generated content, invite people to our website to share their own stories of how they were tackling the challenge of gender equality in their communities, but also coming face to face with it, ensuring intimately on what those experiences were like. And so that really, you know, helps with representation because not only are you inviting the stories, but you're giving them a platform um, that they can also share with their communities who can be assured that when they come to our properties, they will see themselves represented. So that's sort of how it unfolded for us. And I think to this day, I'm always just in awe, especially as a woman from outside of the US. Um, you know, I like to refer to myself as a quadruple minority in many aspects, but that brings me great joy to know that we're doing it. Can we do better? Absolutely, right? But the key thing is to really, as I said, pass the mic once you understand that there is not only opportunity, um, but really strong signals that diversification will augur well for you. Yeah, I, I love that idea that like you already had the diversity in your audience. You just needed to start meeting people where they were and rethinking your content. And again, just like great comms practice of like really producing relevant content um, for the people that you're trying to reach instead of saying, I'm gonna reach this audience and I don't know if we have anything relevant for them, right? It's a, in some ways, it's a little bit of a backwards way to think about it of just like wanting a diverse audience, whatever that means, not knowing if you have relevant content. Um, you know, and what strikes me about that is whether you're talking about kind of new content practices or strong data, um, what that actually requires is some investment on the part of your team, your organization to um, implement those things. And so I'm curious um, from the other panelists, you know, if anyone has ideas, like how are you having these conversations with your team and, you know, able to advocate for, like, we need investment in particular things, right? It's, it's, not just like we change our mind and want a different audience and it happens, we actually have to invest the time and the money. Um, how are those conversations happening? And, and maybe if you have examples that you could share. Yeah, I can jump in. So I'm lucky to work at a place that really prioritizes diversity, equity, and inclusion from the top. And I feel like, you know, over the last few years, it used to be DEI was kind of like, the separate thing. So like we did our jobs and then when we had time, we would do the DEI parts of our jobs. But for me, that's completely changed in the last three to four years where it's really fully integrated into everything we do. So our communications team is, is thinking about these questions about audience and the language that we're using. Um, this idea of, of, you know, how to have credibility with, with diverse audiences is really top of mind for us. Um, so we've invested a lot of resources into the thinking through and planning. And several years back, we actually hired uh, some DEI consultants to do an audit of our content. And so they looked at a bunch of our publications and they were, um, you know, kind of looking at the language and the way that uh, our authors were 
describing the people at the heart of our social and economic policy research. And they found that some of the language um, was, you know, a bit alienating, a bit aloof, you know, kind of that cold, detached researcher voice. Um, and given that so much of our research focuses on, um, you know, people with low income, people experiencing homelessness, we have since put forward just a greater effort to be a little bit more thoughtful and a little bit more sensitive as far as how we're, we're describing the people at the heart of our research. And so we've invested some resources into some internal toolkits. Um, we just call them the language toolkits. And so we have guidance for people that are writing about you know, people coming out of incarceration, um, you know, people that are experiencing all these different stigmas, just to make sure we're, we're doing our part to not perpetuate harmful narratives to not perpetuate stereotypes. Um, so that's kind of been an internal movement. And you know, we're hoping to at one point share that more broadly. But I guess to Jim's point earlier, we would consider ourselves ourselves still evolving, you know, and still very much kind of a learning phase with all of this. This is so interesting to hear. And um and just um I love uh hearing your perspectives, Kate and Sue Ann. And um and I also just want to just highlight the one, uh, the one phrase that really resonated with me um, in terms of what Sue Ann was saying around passing the mic, um, because for us as a, as a content company, uh, it's so critical, right? Uh, in terms of who, like which filmmakers we're working with um, and which artists we want to, uh, to, to lift up and which voices and experiences that are, are not, being, uh, not being told, right? A um, couple of examples of that would be, um, you know, working with, um, uh, working with Shaka King, who's the, the director of who was the director of, of Jews and the Black Messiah. Um, that was one example of of, of uh, you know of, of just really these great young artists that, that are starting to, to, to make a splash, um, and also um, trying to uplift voices like uh, with the film Roma um, and being able to, to to tell a family story from um, from the lens of of a domestic worker. Who, by the way, because of that film, we we're also able to um, to use that film as a way to advocate for uh, domestic workers' rights in Mexico, and they actually did pass the equivalent of a, of a social security um, 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 uh, law uh, that, that gave, gave more benefits to, to domestic workers in Mexico. So that was really cool to see. Um, and I think, you know, for us internally, um, as, as a part of our journey, we've been very, very, um, we've just been trying to really build the right infrastructure for how we um, hold, hold ourselves accountable um, for our diversity, belonging, and, and inclusion journey. Um, and that also uh, in, involves data, it involves um, um, bringing in um, expertise, it involves trying to be consistent in our training, um, consistent in how we also embed um, a, lot of our, um, a lot of our diversity and belonging and inclusion goals into our operations. Um, and this is still um, this is still a muscle that we're that we're we're developing, um, and we're learning a lot from from doing things well and doing things not as well. Um, and so I think it's always great to hear from from other 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 companies and, and other organizations to hear how you guys have been um, been been working through that too. But um, just to again start to, to echo the, my my point earlier, which is um, it, it really begins it really begins with with um, with us. It really begins with our, our team. It begins to who we hire begins in how we incentivize um, um, our, our work, how we set goals. Um, and eventually, um, I think from, from there, by changing from the inside out, um, our outside um, perspective in, in the films that we, that we produce um, will hopefully give people a, um, a broader, or at least give broader audiences uh, uh, some more empathy and understanding uh, of a different person's perspective that they may not have heard or experienced in their lives. That's such an important point, Jim, because the, the reshaping of an internal organization, everything from your staff to your partners and vendors to the operational policies you have is, you know, it may not be on the surface visible to your audiences, but can play these really subtle parts in, in how your story gets told of any organization. And, you know, I just think about the million decisions that anyone makes, whether you're a fundraiser or, you know, a marketing professional, you know, if you're writing that email, you are writing copy, choosing language, picking graphics, you're choosing, you know, even what platforms to test your email on and, you know, how mobile friendly is it? All of these things that, you know, any one of those steps, we all have our internal biases. And so if our teams do not reflect, you know, the sort of um, stories we're trying to tell or the audiences we're trying to reach, it can have, you know, a certain outsized impact on, on the efficacy of that. 
you know, one of the things that I also think is important is, um, you know, I think as people ask me this question of how do I diversify my audience, something that didn't sit super well with me is I felt like there was this kind of unspoken tactical goal of like, we want the visible kind of diversity. You know, we're all talking about racial equity. We want to reach, um, you know, uh, more kind of people of color and communities of color. Um, but that's not the only kind of diversity. And I think we all know that sort of an intersectional approach to diversity is, is the most impactful one. And so I'm curious from, from the panelists, you know, what other ways are you trying to kind of expand your communications practices or your audiences in terms of, you know, different communities, different identities, um, you know, different practices you've put in place? Yeah, I can get started. Um, for us, you know, it's diversity in all its dimensions, right? Whether we're talking about the extent to which someone dis who's disabled um, can come to your website and still have a pretty positive experience, um, whether you're talking LGBTQIA plus communities, um, whether you're talking um, diverse socioeconomic groups, typically in international development, um, people just assume it's about benefiting people in low to middle income countries and not necessarily folks in um, higher income countries. Um, but we do know that there is room for challenging those assumptions, right? Because, you know, the world's um, framework for achieving a better future for all by 2030, um, which 195 countries agree to, right, isn't just for the world's poorest, you know, it's for the kid in an urban area as well. Um, it is for an elderly person um, in a rural area here in the United States of America. And so just, you know, really thinking about diversity in all its forms, not necessarily just to say, hey, we're diverse and, and we're listening and um, we're on trend, um, but really to ensure that those people who actually stand to gain more um, from efforts to make our planet a more sustainable place um, are front and center, um, but also are benefiting and thriving as a result of our communications. I think that's key. And sometimes we often forget um, that that is one of the aspects we ought to be exploring as well, particularly in international affairs and global development, where there's still a lot of work to be done. Yeah, so in terms of uh, other types of diversity, similar to Sue Ann, we're thinking a lot about accessibility, um, I guess, tactically thinking about our events, how to make those more accessible. Uh, we just did a refresh of our website with some, some increased accessibility measures um, built into that. Um, but I think, yeah, also echoing some of the earlier comments, I think it starts with, with who's representing your organization, you know, and creating an environment where people can live authentically and bring their full selves to work. And I think that comes through when you're a hiring manager, um, you know, when you're writing a job description, if you can sort of have some indicators in that text about, you know, the fact that you're, you're actively, proactively trying to create an inclusive and welcoming work environment for all people. You know, I think that goes a long way to communicating with, with potential candidates um, and, and really enticing them, you know, to, to come and work for your company. Um, so I think, yeah, a, a lot of it really comes back to um, be, being that representation, you know, hiring people, having people at those senior levels that, that are spokespeople and that represent your organization um, and letting people see that they are reflected within that organization. Yeah, I would agree with um, everything that both Kate and Sue Ann said, um, with the addition that one thing that we started to try to do is, is to, to embed, um, you know, more consistent cycles for feedback um, uh, internally. Um, and so, um, again, going to the point of trying to develop authentic um, diversity, it's also really making sure um, that we are listening to people um, and really listening to members of our team and training ourselves to, yeah, to listen more and, and talk less uh, and, um, and to make sure that that's embedded in our, in our systems and our operations. I like that. That's a, such a simple thing to do is just like have more people review it. <laughs> um, that's great. And we did get a question from Lauren in the chat um, that I wanted to raise. Um, and I think it's an important one because, you know, for many of us in this sort of nonprofit social sector, it's not uncommon to be at an organization that is disproportionately white. 
whereas the work we do is reflective of or has impact on communities of color. Um, and so Lauren is asking, how do you incorporate standards or expectations to get permission to tell the stories of your constituents and compensate them for their stories and their time? Um, and Lauren, you're not the only person, someone asked me this exact question um, in a you know informal dialogue a week or so ago and um, where we were talking about the distinction between like having legal permission to do it, right? If you're getting consent forms or have all of the right kind of check boxes and people register for your events about recordings and things versus truly engaging people um, you know, in a, in a fair way that recognizes those tricky power dynamics. So maybe folks on the panel have some thoughts around that. Yeah, actually, I'd, I'd love to take that a stab at that because I think that's a really, really important question. Um, and this really goes back to um, how do you how do you talk to communities and how do you um, how do you really kind of lift up communities in the most authentic way, in a way that seems um, truly relational rather than transactional, um, truly long-term versus, um, versus for that activation. And, and I don't have a, I don't have a, um, I'm not going to share a, like any sort of like uh, templatized formula, but I think it still goes back to the point that you really got to listen to that community and you really got to um, develop a, a strong relationship with that community, develop trust with that community um, before you can really feel, um, you know, feel like you are telling their stories authentically um, without again seeming like you're very transactional. So just one example, one thing we're going through right now. Um, so we actually had a, a film, we have a documentary that recently was um, that, that um, made a big splash at, at Sundance and, and eventually got, um, um, is now, we're now working with the Obama Foundation, um, sorry, the, the Obamas and also um, um, Netflix uh, to really present this film. It's called uh, Descendant. And it's about the uh, descendants of uh, the last slave ship to, uh, to come back to the United States. Um, it's a community in Alabama, uh, in, a, in, a, in a place called Africa Town, um, and you know, there's some celebrities like, like there's one celebrity, Questlove, um, whose family is actually a descendant of this community, which is really interesting. But anyway, I think the the point is we're trying to figure out how do we best work with them, um, how do we best uh, tell their stories, should we tell their stories um, beyond what's being shown uh, in the film, and I think there's a really strong sense of recognizing that just by taking up their time, just by having a series of conversations, you're, there is a trade-off to that because they themselves in their community, they, are, they, are, um, they have their own needs, they have their own um, challenges. And so it's really important to recognize that even um, when you think you are trying to do good within a community, you still have to sit back and say, okay, well, is my action downstream causing greater harm? Um, and so I just really encourage everyone to, to spend time listening, to spend time um, really letting them lead you, um, because there are implications for, um, for, for our enthusiasm and, and, and our, our ambitions um, to really tell their stories. Yes, to everything Jim said, um, but I also want to underscore the point of representation here. Who's approaching the community? with the request, right? So 100% if the person doing the approaching and reaching out looks like that community, you've already made a giant leap to rebuilding the trust that you need. And I think that, you know, we've all talked about representation in this call and in this meeting, um, but that's where I think that's a practical example of where it can make such a difference because you know that that will augur well in terms of building trust, building connection. Um, and then I think there's a point here about getting permission. You know, one thing that we've recognized, consent forms are complicated, they're cumbersome, they're intimidating. Um, are we doing a good enough job at translating and distilling that in a way that when a person lifts a pen to sign that line, they're assured that this is a document they can trust and that they understand the implications of it. So I just wanted to share that as one learning that we've had recently. And we're still even, you know, after having reworked the consent forms late last year, we're still not happy with them. We're going to give it another crack to ensure that this form can 
be widely embraced, received, whether we're here in the United States or out in the field on a mission um, in another country um, with people with varying levels of literacy and English speaking capability. So also just wanting to make that point um, that there is scope for thinking more deeply about the actual tools that we use um, in communities who um, are typically not trusting of folks who show up with cameras and notepads and other instruments. That's such a good point. It's not just, you know, getting the sort of approval, but it's making that accessible. And then to Jim's point, making it one piece of an ongoing relationship, right? It, that those are things that can feel really transactional, um, even if we have the best of intentions to have someone share their story or participate in, in research, whatever the case may be. Um, uh, Deborah actually asked a question in the chat that was someplace I wanted to go next, which is, you know, talking about how um, a lot of this, these ideas scale up and down for different kinds of organizations. And I've actually been jotting down as you all chat, like there's lots of interesting tactical ideas here that like, you know, if people are in smaller organizations, um, you know, than, than some of the ones you all represent, um, how can they uh, Kind of implement some of these things, whether it's creating sort of the language guidelines for your comms team or adding an extra feedback cycles or, you know, having pass the mic initiatives, those sorts of things. Um, but Deborah asked a question that's kind of the flip side of that, which is, you know, part of her role, in addition to getting messaging out to new and diverse audiences, is also to position their organization, which is maybe a, a smaller um, organization, as a sort of well respected brand. Um, and so how do you kind of merge these um, two approaches, one reaching new people, but also making sure it's supportive of your brand, it's helping you scale and expand kind of the general impact of your brand and messaging. Anyone wanna take that one on? Kate, do you wanna go? Sure, I can hop in. So I think it goes back to, to this discussion about values that, that came up earlier, you know, and really having clear organizational values. You know, for us, a lot of it is um, about independence and transparency. And so no matter what our communications effort is, if it's, if it's doing work locally in the community around Washington, DC, or if it's a big national media campaign, you know, those values really, really guide and shape that effort. But I think, yeah, I think it also just goes back to just some of the the core aspects of strategic communications planning and just, um, you know, no matter what that interaction is, being thoughtful about who your audience is, what your ultimate goal is, you know, what, what is the messaging that's going to resonate the most with them? Um, and how are you going to know whether or not you are successful? So I think just applying those sort of core um, strategic communications sort of guidelines and questions can help, you know, inform an effort of, of whatever scale. So, Wayne, did you want to tag on to that or you were just passing the mic? It's to fine. I was passing the mic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, if anyone else has questions to pose, I want to make sure we leave time for questions from the audience. Um, you know, you're welcome to uh, type them in the chat or if you want to sort of raise your hand and uh, um, join us on the discussion, you're welcome to do that as well. maybe while folks are potentially thinking of a, of a last question. Um, you know, one of the things that I really enjoyed um, about some of the um, uh, answers you all gave is that this needs to be an ongoing relationship with the communities you're reaching. It needs to be reflected in your internal kind of ways that you work. And so I wondered if anyone had interesting examples of kind of internal shifts that you've made to your practices. Um, or things that you've done as a team to sort of, you know, not necessarily change your communications and outreach practices, but um, how has your team's approach shifted in the last couple of years? Yeah, I can share a bit on that. Um, definitely, you know, belonging is important, right? Um, and I think Jim also made the point earlier that you don't just want to reach out for the activation and then um, sort of move on. Um, for me, just creating a robust directory 
um, of everyone we come into contact with, their issue, issue their passions, their interests, um, their locations, um, their experiences. Um, I think that's really a strength because maybe the you know, the woman who came to the website and shared her story about the fight for gender equality um, now becomes a panelist um, at an international event where she can also share stories. And that's one of the things that I enjoy about UN Foundation is that we help convene people with diverse perspectives from diverse backgrounds. And, and for me, that's been a strength of ours and orienting um, to keep the conversation going and to keep the representation going um, and also to invite suggestions on who else they think might be powerful voices in the conversation. Um, that's really been um, helpful to us and um, I think is going to be something that's going to set up, set us up well to not just build those relationships but maintain them um, and have it be less one way and more two way in the future. Yeah, so this is less on my team, but more throughout urban and uh, kind of similar to what Suzanne was saying, we're kind of rethinking, well, we have a cohort of researchers who are kind of rethinking the relationship between researchers and the research. And so they are driving um, a methodology called community engaged methods or community based participatory research where, um, you know, instead of starting out with the research question and the whole, the whole study kind of pre-baked, you really engage community members from day one on, you know, what are the questions that are most important to them to have answered? What's gonna actually benefit them, you know, and, and, and help their community instead of just something getting written up in a study that they never get to see. Um, and so it really is a partnership. It, it really aims to kind of share the balance of power between the researchers and the community partners. Um, and I think ultimately, you know, it leads to much better data, right? Because you're just getting it sourced directly from, from the people who <laughs> are at the heart of the study. Um, and then a, a core aspect of it too is the dissemination phase. So bringing the data back to the community when the study is done, communicating it in accessible and relevant ways. And to the earlier point about, you know, having long-term relationships, staying, staying there, you know, not just dipping out once the study is done and the funding runs out, but really staying there for the long-term to apply the insights from that data and stay in that long-term partnership with community members. That's a very good point. And um, Amanda asked a question in the chat, and I don't know, Jim, if you wanna tackle this general internal question, but maybe with this flavor um, of how do you build alignment? And so Amanda is kind of a one person comms team and, and needing to get alignment and buy-in from other departments and folks in their organization. And so, Maybe you can talk a little bit about how your team has built alignment on um, all of your efforts around DEI. Yeah, I think um, that's a great question. I think um, something like something like um, diversity, belonging, inclusion. I think has to be it has to start from the top, um, and it has to has to be a, um, a an organizational wide uh, initiative. It has to, and there needs to be consistency in terms of um, um, how we are. Um, how we are training people, um, how we are talking about um, um, a lot of these issues, how we um, use the lens of uh, diversity, belonging, inclusion when we are um, talking about the victories that we have as, as an organization, when we're talking about the challenges, um, how do we really maintain a, that level of accountability? Um, and it's hard, right? It's hard because um, um, there are so many different types of things that we could potentially be implementing, but it really just comes down to um, how you build a culture and a consistency um, in being able to talk about and to train people um, in a lot of these these areas. Uh, and so, there's really the the I think the biggest challenge is is how do you make that bridge between um, you know the, the the training and, and the practice? Because oftentimes, of course, um, you know real life situations are are extremely complicated and extremely nuanced. So I, I think for us, it's, it's making sure that we consistently have um, um, the ability to develop skills and then consistently being able to, um, to apply those skills when, um, when there are situations that happen. And um, oftentimes, you know, we, everyone, I'm sure all of you are, are running 100 miles an hour and trying to reach your goals and trying to, to do great work. 
Um, but I think it's important after your initiatives, after your activations, after your um, after you, you make a, a statement in the world, to take a step back and and to look in and see, okay, well, how was this done, um, and and how did it get received, and what do we hear from the people that we're trying to reach in terms of our message? So I really think it's important to um, you know that that it's it's really kind of developing this entire um, feedback loop. And taking time to understand it and taking time to say, okay, well, did we really approach this from a lens of really uplifting this community? Um, or were we trying to, to do something that was a lot more, for lack of a better term, transactional? Um, and, and if it is, it's okay. It's just, but it's, I think it's important to just take a step back and say, okay, did we really, um, were we really doing this through the lens of everything that we've learned and are trying to progress in our um, diversity and belonging and inclusion journey? Um, or are we, do we, do we do it in a way that, that really kind of brought back old habits? Um, and do we want to change that? So I think it's important always to, to take a step back and, and always be able to, to look and, and say, okay, well, you know, what can we do differently and what can we do better? I love that point, Jim, that it's not just about talking about your ideals and what you want to do, but examining how it played out. And in fact, talking about the challenges, because I think you know, hopefully most of the people on this call and, and in your organizations kind of all agree on the foundational, like, sure, we want to be more inclusive, um, but it's much harder to examine, like, where have we misstepped? Um, and I think making space for that conversation is, is really wonderful. Um, recognizing that we're going to start hitting the top of the hour soon, I think I've got one more maybe like rapid fire round robin for folks that came in the chat. Someone was asking about what resources you like to sort of get ideas or keep up with things that are going on in the DEI space or even kind of um, inclusive comms in general. Um, and while you all are thinking about that, I'll, I'll share the one that I like. Um, you know, there's a, or a, a newsletter called Better Allies um, that is really wonderful. And part of what I like about it is it's really tactical. Um, you know, I also being in leadership here at PTKO, we're a fairly small organization. And so, um, you know, very different from the Urban Institute or the UN Foundation or even participant media, but getting those really specific ideas of here's something we can do to change the way we communicate, or here's something we can do to change the way our team interacts or um, an operational policy. Um, they send you five ideas every week in your email, um, you know, and some of it is just about our one-on-one our -on -one interactions with our colleagues. So that's one that I love. I, I dropped the link in the chat, um, but let's run through. Sue Ann, I don't know if you've got one that came to mind for you. Actually, I'm looking for a link to drop in the chat, so just stand by for that. Okay. Um, it's actually a really helpful library of like language and, and, and terms mm -hmm. to use, so I'm going to send that shortly. Great. Kate or Jim, is there one that comes up for you all? Yeah, I have to give a shout out to the Communications Network, which has really leaned into this topic in the last couple of years. Um, so they give amazing webinars. They have some toolkits on their website. I can drop the link in as well. Um, and then I'm also very lucky to work at a place that is doing a lot of work on racial equity. Um, and so, you know, if folks want to check out our website as well, we've got a, a lot of great resources and great thinking on these issues. I'll say for me personally, um, you know, I, I see there, I think there are a lot of publications that have started to embrace um, this conversation more. And I have to say one thing from a very tactical level, um, I love the Harvard Business Review's um, kind of executive, um, they do this like daily executive email um, that oftentimes, um, you know, they, they actually do have some really interesting, you know, small um, recommendations for how to, to continue to, to live through, live your values and also live uh, to, to, to operate and lead through a lens of, uh, of diversity, belonging, and inclusion. So um, if you get a chance to sign up for it, it's really, it's, it's helpful. Uh, and a lot of times these little topics oftentimes are, are very relevant to, to my daily work. And I love seeing it uh, just pop up every day in my inbox. Great. And Suanne, you wanna say something about the one that you shared in the chat? Um, yeah, I think um, just generally give this site um, a whirl because they offer free consultations as well. Um, on getting your language up to speed. They offer workshops um, and there's also a really helpful guide. Like if there's a term that you're wrestling with, you're not sure if that's the appropriate term, um, just look it up. Um, and they, the guidance is really, really robust. And I love that it's also globally minded and not just um, you know focused on one particular country or geography. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And we will 
try to um, grab those links and, and maybe put them in our follow-up email as well um, so folks have access to them. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I think we got to most of the questions that came through in the chat, but this has been a really wonderful dialogue. And Sue Ann and Kate and Jim, thank you so much for sharing your uh, ideas and inspiration from what you and your teams are doing. Um, for the folks that joined us today, thank you again for giving us your time. Um, we will be sharing a recording of this via email, so please feel free to pass it on to your friends and colleagues. Um, and please do stay engaged with us. We've got kind of a steady stream of, you know, free thought leadership and content out there. So a lot of our old uh, webinars are hosted on our website. Um, there's a podcast that Tony, our CEO, hosts, which you can find on Spotify, um, our blog. And if you're not signed up for the email newsletter to get those, please do so on our website. Um, but I've really appreciated everyone joining us today. We'll also be pinging you a survey in the follow-up email. Um, and I would actually, and Mickey has just stuck it in the chat as well. So I would please encourage you to send your feedback. We really appreciate um, hearing from everyone whether these conversations were useful to you. And if you've got ideas for another discussion or panel we ought to have and you'd like to join us for it, um, please send it along. We'd love to hear from you.